In the next 20 minutes, I'll show you how to build same enterprise grade API architecture that powers Fortune 500 application. This isn't theory, it's a battle tested architecture from my 17 years of experience in the trenches. So I will implement clean architecture, repository pattern and set the foundation for AI integration all with production ready code you can use today. I am Harsimal Singh and welcome to TechScripted. After 17 years of experience in enterprise development and my involvement in SDLC, I am here to share real world production grade solutions. Today, we are building a document management system, but here's the key. We are building it right. In enterprise, you can't just throw code together. We need maintainability in the code so that other developers will work on this. It has to be testable so that everything must be unit testable. It should be scalable to handle the growth. And uh, one more important point is separation of concern so that each layer should have only one job. Let me show you the architecture of my tech scripted enterprise application. This is clean architecture. Notice how dependencies flow inwards. The domain is at the center and it knows nothing about the database or APIs. This is crucial because in six months when your CTO says we are moving from SQL Server to Postgres, so you only need to change one layer. That's all. So now. I'm showing you solution structure here. If I have to show this as an onion architecture, so this is the representation which represents the onion architecture. So here I have created my solution. So now if you pay attention here, uh, you can see the name I had set as TechScripted.EnterpriseAI. So I am using here dots in the namespaces to show hierarchy. TechScripted is my company namespace and Enterprise AI is my product. So now, uh, I had already created uh, projects here, so I will explain each and every layer starting from core layer that is our domain. It contains entities, interfaces, business rules, zero external dependencies. So if I talk about entities that are our business objects and uh, interfaces are the contracts that other, other layers must follow. Why? Because business rules don't change when the technology changes. A document is a document whether you store it in SQL or you store it in Postgres or MongoDB or whatsoever. Okay? And then I have infrastructure layer in my solution. Uh, this is where I had implemented technical concerns like database access where I'm using entity framework, uh, external service calls, file system operations. So this layer depends on core and never the other way around. Okay, And then I have uh, API layer also. This is my presentation layer where I have controller, DTOs that are data transfer objects as you already know, middleware and configurations. So one critical part uh, which I want to just mention here is the API layer never talks directly to the database. It goes through the interfaces. This is the dependency inversion in action. Starting with the domain layer, I'll be showing you. I'm already had opened the base entities file here. Okay, this is my base entity code, which is in the namespace expected core entities. Okay, why these fields? A GUID ID is a globally unique works in distributed systems, and then I have the field created at and updated at. This is a trial uh, audit trial crucial for compliance and created by I'm using uh, suppose who made the changes required in uh, and is deleted is a soft delete that actually never deletes data in enterprise systems. Now I will show you my document.cs file here like here as you can see these are my field like title content category and status where I'm initializing them mostly the strings I'm initializing them string.empty and uh, this uh, returning the object as document status I'm uh, Initializing with document status or draft because draft will be the initial stage and I'm already initializing with the with the draft. But why I am doing that? Now you should always remember always initialize string to string.empty. Null strings are the enemy of stable applications. Please note, null strings are enemy of the stable application. Those who had worked at the starting of 2000 era must be knowing how we used to handle those empty strings at, at that time. So in, in early days, especially while uh, it was .NET 3.5, those people who had started their beginning either in uh, three, two point, from 2.0 onwards and starting with 3.5, then that time it was uh, difficult handling and uh, we used to wrap a lot wherever we used to handle the string. So now we can simply avoid that situation by using string.empty here in the initialization only and the getter setters here only. So now coming to the repository interfaces here, in the interfaces section inside the core, I have generic repository interface. What you notice the first thing, the core layer defines the interface but doesn't implement it. Why? Because core doesn't know or care how data is stored. That's the infrastructure's job. 
This is the dependency inversion principle. High level modules, that is core, should not depend on the low level modules like infrastructure layer. Both should depend on abstraction interface. Okay, so this is where the abstraction interface shines in the clean architecture. Coming down to the infrastructure level implementation, I'm showing here. So coming on to infrastructure project here, I have my application DB context file here. So the things you should notice in this architecture, I have one model creating function. So what exactly is happening here, especially in this where I am creating indexes. Okay. So the fields which will be there in the database, I'm adding indexes on those fields. Why? Because that is the enterprise consideration to always add indexes on the fields you will query frequently. Uh, this is the difference between a query that is taking 10 milliseconds versus the query which takes 10 seconds when there's millions of records there in the DB. Okay, in that table. Yeah. And here coming down to my generic repository. Now the question is why generic repository? There are a few things for which we need a generic repository. First, we have to implement DRY principle, which says don't repeat yourself. So that is one reason. Another is consistency in such a way that all entities are accessed the same way. Another point, which is testability so that each and every module should be easy to mock for unit tests. So that is the prime reason why we are using generic repository. Now coming to the unit of work pattern. Okay. That is my last file here in this uh, infrastructure layer, this one. So the unit of work pattern is controversial, but in enterprise apps, it's essential. Okay. So why I'm using a unit of work here, because I want to ensure all changes are saved together as a single transaction. And also single, uh, this should be a single place to add cross cutting concerns. And what makes testing easier? Mock one interface instead of many. That is the reason. Now I'm moving to the API part. Modern .NET uses minimal APIs, but we are structuring for enterprise scale. So there is one production tip. Uh, always use structured logging. When debugging, suppose when debugging issues at 3 a.m., you will thank yourself for good logs. Yeah. So, so here you will notice enable retry on failure I'm using. So why I am using this retry logic? Because network hiccups happen. So this prevents your app from crashing due to temporary connection issues. So that is the reason you should use this. And uh, coming on to the controller part now, here I have my documents controller. Yeah, you can see. Now my controller is following REST principles. Now I show you. So, so here, key decisions I had made to implement versioning in the URL so that when V2 comes, V1 still works. Okay, for that. And uh, I document service that interface I'm using so that it should never inject repositories directly into the controllers. They here, yeah. And one more thing, one interface I logger I'm using. This one, yeah. As you can see in the implementation, in my API method, that every action should be logged. So, one tip in case of DTOs here document.dtos file. So keep in mind that never expose your entities directly. Always use DTOs. DTOs provide security by not exposing the internal fields. And in case of validation, different rules are made for different operations. So with DTOs, we can create an evolution by changing DTOs without breaking the domain. Now comes in the error handling part. This is my error handling middleware file in the middleware directory that is also inside the API. Yeah. Why we require this middleware error handling? Because in legacy days, most of you must have seen applications where you open a page and it shows you uh, error message with somewhat something like connection string written down in the error, right? It, 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 it is mentioned in the error itself, something related to the connection string. So if you, apply or if you implement global error handling, so that prevents that disaster. So here I'm showing the request flow diagram. So this diagram shows exactly how a request flows through my clean architecture. So here when a client makes a request, that request hits my middleware pipeline first. 
going through authentication, authorization, error handling, and logging. Then that request reaches the controller, and that controller part validates the input and also the service layer. The service layer contains the business logic and orchestrates the operation. And this service calls the repository through an interface. I had never directly accessed the database from the service. The repository executes the actual database query using entity framework. Then the response flows back through the same layers with DTOs ensuring we never expose our domain entities directly. So let me show you my database schema here. Uh, as you can see, my database schema is created with entity frameworks code first approach. And notice every table inherits from base entity, giving me consistent audit fields. The documents table has indexes on frequently queried fields. This is crucial for performance and I am using soft deletes with the global query filter. I mean, uh, deleted records stay in the database, but are automatically filtered out of all queries. So based on that flag, I will be doing that. Coming to API endpoints, this is my RESTful API service, which I had shown using the swagger. And uh, I am following the REST conventions, strictly get for retrieval, post for creation, put for update, and delete for removal. Notice the versioning in the URL, that is API v1. So this allows me to maintain backward compatibility. So in case when I release version v2, v1 should also work, like as I shown you in the code. My each endpoint returns appropriate HTTP status codes. The analyze endpoint is particularly interesting here, where I will integrate AI in the next episode. Yeah, so coming to repository pattern with the unit of work, which is at the heart of my data access strategy. This core layer defines interfaces. It says what we need, this infrastructure layer provides the implementation. And uh, on the generic repository, if you see that handles common operations of all the entities. While specifically saying document repository add custom queries. Yeah, the unit of work ensures all changes are saved together in a transaction. So this pattern makes the code highly testable. In unit tests, we just mock these interfaces and we're done. Okay, so I'm uh, running this application to show you how the APIs look like and uh, testing the APIs. Another way you can, this is the, one of the way you must have seen how I'm running this. Yeah, here we can see in the swagger, I can see all my APIs, what all I made here, they are showing. And these are my DTOs, it is showing, yeah. So get, it will show us the, let me, let's try this out. Okay. So any status, uh, one or two, or maybe. So this is the validation it is showing. Okay, so version one. Category tutorial version one. So here I'm getting the my reports. My first API document with this title I'm getting here. Category tutorial status graph. Okay, so if I change the status to one. Exactly what all status are there in the graph. So one is there in the publish, the also it's shown. Publish. So if I change it to zero, then okay. So this is my get method. And uh, this is my post method I will show you. So here I'll put my own. So this is giving you a structure of the JSON which you can send, but I have this one. Okay, wait a second. I'm executing. Telling all the Yeah, which validation is here? Version. I need to provide a version. Okay, I'm providing version one here. Good that uh, our validation is working here. Oh now it is fine. Yeah. Okay, it's executed. Now we'll check this in the get method once again. Entering Accepted as a category version one, yeah, and I executed it. So here we got this is the entry which should be there. So guys, currently I'm using local DB here. Why? Because at the later stage when we'll be integrating 
in uh, the current uh, .NET 8 APIs with AI. I may be changing it to the Postgres because of that. Currently, I'm keeping the local DB in for the dev purpose. Currently, here it's shown as fine. Then this is the way I had shown you my APIs how they are working. So let me check the ID of that one. version 1 required so this will delete that existing entry which we made okay so here it deleted that again if we go and see that in the get method for texture version 1 yeah, it, it is not there now yeah you can see so, so as you have seen now my api is running successfully database is connected swagger ui is working and professional logging is enabled error handling is in place and I have the clean architecture implemented. So as you can see here in the database, indexes are created here, soft delete, filter is applied, audit fields are populated automatically. With this, what we have built today is the foundation of every successful enterprise application I had worked on. So this architecture has powered systems handling millions of requests per day. So here are the key takeaways. The first is the clean architecture. This isn't overkill, it's an insurance, right? And the interfaces that enables testing and flexibility and regarding the proper logging which i had uh, implemented that saves debugging time and uh, last not the least the global error handling that prevents security leaks so in the next episode i will integrate azure open ai to add intelligent document analysis imagine documents that summarize themselves extract key points and classify automatically so this code is there on github link is there in the description please start the repo if you if it help you and subscribe to see how i will add ai capabilities to this foundation. Remember, I am not building toy apps here, okay? So I'm building the future one enterprise grade component at a time. So until next time, keep coding, keep learning, and keep building system that scale.